good afternoon sir good afternoon ma'am how how are you can you hear me you are good Hi, thank you very much we can hear you uh, so i welcome all the attendees and participants to our webinar series 2 the first episode in conversation with architect fawad husain we have dr ritu gulati with us who will be having a dialogue with him on let us consider architectural thinking so i would like ritu ma'am to please introduce the architect for today and uh, start the webinar thank you juveria thank you so much i hope i'm audible to all yes ma'am yes, can you hear yes. me great 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 so uh, thank you fawad for joining us and uh, i would uh, welcome all the student participants and i'll take the opportunity to thank nishant and rohit jigyasu through which we were able to get in touch with uh, fawad and uh, in their words it's a very interesting architectural practice and uh, mm -hmm. it's great to see work all over the globe and people having similar ideas and ideas about architecture and fawad runs the studio by the name of msa and it is a studio of architects interior designers visualizers and thinkers based in lahore pakistan it is an award winning practice recognized as one of the most influential names in architecture design for 2016 by architectural digest india from modest beginning with two people msa has grown to an office with a three tier management structure the interdisciplinary approach at msa results in an uncommon level of refinement to the architectural world generating an opportunity to create spaces imbued with experiences msa's interdisciplinary approach has a lot to do with the diverse academic background of its principles coming from backgrounds of philosophy and psychology the principles at msa are usually in a strong position to negotiate with the design issues both in and outside the realm of architecture apart from contributing to the interdisciplinary approach that msa has this further allows the firm to look at the problem from multiple perspectives and really get into the design process for msa the issue is more about how to approach an issue rather than just to gear for its resolution in order to further strengthen the approach msa has gone a step ahead to create a sep separate division of its own with designated resources known as msi ri that is the research initiative this is an independent research in engine that fuels the research which then becomes part and parcel of what msa produces on its own the collaboration between msa and ri give itself gives rise to interesting opportunities that allow the firm to explore novel ideas that inform their design the nature of rigorous collaboration between msa ri and msa give rise to a novel novel idea of oh this novel word is very dangerous nowadays novel idea okay. of msa collaborative it is an initiative that brings professionals from other disciplines on board keeping in view the nature of the projects in order to develop a cohesive perspective to address the issues posed by the project Uh, architect fawad is also an associate professor and coordinator at the school of architecture design and urbanism so i am hoping that he will talk about his teaching methodologies and then experimentation with design and looking forward to this really interesting pre presentation by architect fawad i request all the students to uh, note their questions or write them in the chat and after the session ends we can discuss all of them with fawad so over to you and uh, go on please uh thank you uh, thank you very much uh, dear ritu gulati for the introduction and uh, i'm thankful uh, to principal and dean architecture school of aktu lucknow professor dr vandana saigal for providing me with this opportunity and it is a real pleasure indeed for me to present our work on this prestigious platform and uh, special thanks to my friend and teacher rohit for introducing and linking me to all of you okay uh, in this presentation i would like to explain some of the main ideas that helped shaped our practice these ideas define a conceptual landscape where our architecture situates itself and at the end i will present a range of projects done by us in our studio 
we call it a studio not an office because of the nature of the work involved in doing these projects my other partner in the studio is happened to be my wife as well dina hasan and she is a qualified interior designer with a background of psychology so so when i was halfway through this presentation a question just came to my mind and i feel that that question is relevant and appropriate to be taken up here and now because it relates very much to the situation we all are in and it is not covid 19 believe me no not at all and i think this question needs to be asked by all the students and teachers and professionals who have gone through 5 years of their architectural education from a school of architecture but as it is considered a self evident fact so this question remained unasked therefore unanswered and the question is why we all opted for an architecture school to learn architecture i i, I i repeat my question the question is why we all opted for an architecture school to learn architecture a place where in fact no real time architecture is happening because architecture schools in, in architecture school there is no real time architecture is happening it is happening very much outside the schools but still we all opted to go to one or another architecture school to learn it as opposed to taking other options of going straight in the field to get first and experience and learn it if you allow me to say that these two are two different traditions to train oneself with this whole notion of architecture or familiarize oneself with this whole notion of architecture and i consider both traditions equally acceptable and valuable but i will not discuss the learning of architecture directly from the field but i will focus more on the option of choosing schools of architecture as a learning abroad if we explore it further we see that in the school of architecture we are not just acquainted with art of building but we have been associated ourselves with the discipline of architecture which is more than learning how to put a building together and what exactly this association or this tradition or this discipline means this can best be understood if we try to answer another relatively boring question and that is what is architecture let me make this question interesting for you we may ask what are you referring to when you are uttering the word architecture this very question is one of the most important inquiries that actually help shape our professional practice at msa so what are we referring to so what are we referring to are we are we referring to the building in front of us or are we referring to the design process and the visualization of this building or the work of all the experts laborers who actually helped realize this building our answer to this question would be it is actually architectural thought that we are referring to when we say architecture and to support this i may quote here austrian british philosopher ludwig wittgenstein good architecture expresses a thought and the important point here is that good architecture does not represent the thought but it expresses the thought there's a difference between representation of thought and expressing a thought representation can be understood as translation architecture is not the direct translation of thought but it expresses it without being making itself obvious in a direct way we'll get ourselves further clear on the idea of expression as we move forward in this presentation so if we consider architecture a form of thought then it must be connected to other form of thoughts as well like philosophy psychology science anthropology etc and institute 
or school of architecture is the very place that provides an infrastructure to produce and connect to these various forms of thought. If you even look at the infrastructure a school provides, it is very different from the infrastructure you find in any of the architectural office or in the field. Offices have real-time projects with staff producing workable drawings, builds of quantities, real-time contractors facing real-time economic issues. On the other hand, schools have libraries, doctors of philosophy, virtual projects trying to approach them in, in ideal ways. So this all suggests that the School of Architecture are trying to make us learn something that is not possible out there. And that is exactly why it has been provided with a specific type of infrastructure. And this something, and this something is how to think like an architect. In Mark Wigley's word, I quote, the designer is understood as a public intellectual, crafting forms as thoughts and thoughts as forms. Institute or School of Architecture is a place where you think about the thought of architecture. And the thought now looks the foremost component of architecture. And that is precisely the reason that our education of architecture starts from an institute. Now we move to the second important idea that is shaping our practice. And it is tradition. We really tried to name this term differently as this term has its own baggage, but so far we couldn't. Let me just explain what do we understand by this term. Tradition generally believed to be repetitive and something to be handed down to the next generations. To us, this notion actually is very static and completely excludes the possibility of a new. I would refer here to an ex expert from one of a very eloquent written essays by T.S. Eliot, The Tradition and the Individual Talent. He writes, and I quote, tradition is a matter of wider significance. It cannot be inherited, and if you want it, you must obtain it by great labor, end quote. Then what exactly tradition is, if it is not inherited or repeated for a designer or for an architect, and broadly speaking, for a creative soul, it is more of a historical sense rather than a set of practices. So you are not inheriting anything but you are constructing a historical sense through tradition. And this construction involves great labor, of course. And sense, or construct that sense, it will automatically permeate in the work one is producing without actually showing or repeating itself. This particular way of understanding of tradition prohibits repetition and encourages experimentation. The next idea I would like to explore is the idea of time and space. Generally, architects are too occupied with the idea of space, but we at, us, at MSA feel that the concept of time is crucial in the making of architectural space. That is why time precedes the notion of space. This concept is closely linked with the notion of tradition as well, which we discussed just earlier, because the way we understand time also shapes our understanding of tradition. Commonly, time is thought to flow in a linear fashion, a Western notion, and in cyclic and Eastern way of looking at it. Past, present, and future are common categories of time through them, we understand and talk about it. But these categories, as they appear to be, are not actually exist in a succession. Now here, I am drawing from philosopher and phenomenologist, Morley Ponty, 
that all these three categories are enveloped together in the present. Past is very much part of the present. So do the future, as they are always already with us. That is exactly when we perceive anything, we perceive it with all our past memories and past experiences. This simultaneity of past and present makes the past fluid as opposed to a concrete and unchanging entity. Within the present, we are constantly reinventing our past. Such an understanding provides an opportunity to think something new. On the contrary, repeating the past. The bearing of this kind of view of time on design is that it always demands experimentation rather than interpretation. Experimentation because you already possess past in your present and past is not any more a remote or distant entity that requires interpretation, but it's already part of oneself in the form of a historical sense. This sense demands experimentation that exactly how we define art. Art must experiment, not interpret. So for us, architecture is an art. And yes, it is technical, but it is as technical as a painting or art of sculpture. Lastly, before going to our projects, I would like to discuss the approach that we developed to think architecture, which incorporates all that we discussed earlier, but at the same time, this notion stands independently. We call it localized concepts. Here the term localized is used as an antonym to universal. This term is not referring to specific geographical region or location. There are ideas which are universal, that are overarching, that, that does not change, like in sciences. But localized concepts, on the contrary, are those concepts that develop in response to specific problems and situations. They are constantly in flux. And that is the reason that you will not find any signature style in our practice, because it is not governed by a singular idea, but it thrives on multiplicity and experimentation. In every new project, we find ourselves in unique situations, facing unique problems. So the only answer to these unique conditions is experimentation. These experimentations give way to unique solutions, and that is a constant source of inspiration to our practice that constantly provides fresh perspective and forward-looking attitude to our practice. Now, I would, I would go through some of our projects, uh, starting from the project High Street House. This is the very first project, complete project of our office, of our studio, MSA. This is located in Islamabad. And Islamabad is uh, one of a few design cities like Chandigarh. And this is very impressive city. But, but, but the family who's going to occupy this is a traditional family coming from a city tower. So we are facing two opposing kind of attitude. One, which and the other <laughs> of the client, which are more conservative. Mm -hmm. So the overall look of the architecture is more aggressive. Pavad, Pavad, I'm sorry to interrupt. Of the I, I think, Pavad, yeah, sure. I'm sorry to interrupt. There is some, somebody else's mic. 
mic on and we can't hear you properly can you please mute yourselves all of you all the audience oh. please mute themselves ek bar check kar lijiye aapke sabke mic mute hone chahiye sorry sorry for that please continue so uh, should i start from the uh, from this project again yeah 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 that will be really good please so so okay this is the very first project of our uh, um, studio and this is the first complete project we done and uh, it is called high street house and this is situated and located in islamabad which is um designed by uh, doxyidus and it is exactly like um, if you can compare it with Chand a lot of parallels with chandigarh islamabad and chandigarh so this is a very progressive city of course uh, a family who's going to occupy this uh, house is a very traditional family coming from a northern uh, city peshawar Uh, so we we have to face a great challenge where we have two different kind of attitudes uh, coming to one is of the city which is more progressive and the other side the family which is more uh, traditional and so is very progressive and modern but the planning system of the house is very conventional in this house we have one complete basement which is which has no connection from the outside which is meant for the for their um, you know friends which are coming from the outside which are uh, mainly uh, male friends so the other part of the house is completely private no can go there no one can go there except the family so the overall look of the house if you see the architecture of the house is very modern we all actually uh, made all the fixtures of the house designed all the fixtures even the lights and everything these are some of the sketches of the house and the second important project i would like to discuss is the drafting a retail is a is a is a retail store which is located in peshawar and uh, uh, this is a flagship of a of a of a Uh, clothing detail uh, called Varda, and uh, uh, to do this project, we actually have done a thorough survey of the city of Peshawar and their built environment. We have done the material study of the Peshawar and what kind of materials historically they've been using, and what kind of expertise and craftsmanship is there available in the city. So we employed. all those staff staffmen from the city we have procured all the material from the city and uh, we have come up with uh, uh, this retail which you uh, uh, a local wood on the facade in a very modern way and this is this is the uh, study of the light coming inside from uh, the facade and then when we come inside there we have actually employ the traditional techniques of the city where you make various kind of geometrical forms through wood and then paint them individually so this is a screen that developed by employing the local craft persons and using the local technique of making ornamental surfaces the rest of the store is actually designed by the local very local material which is the brick very basic material 
and this is a local brake produced and is all the walls have been lined with the local brake and this is done by the local craft persons we employed all the local craft persons there as in peshawar and come up with this store this is stair going up which is acting as a uh, leading to the first floor as well as acting as a display these are various images so there are very few materials that are coming up and making this whole retail like metal wood and brick that's it another another project is called uh, retail you must have noticed the spelling of the tail retail is like a story so this whole project is telling a story of a civilization because this is located in an area where once gandhara civilization flourished so we have taken a lot of inspiration from that civilization we have studied the way they work with the different materials the motifs they employ into their uh, different art forms so we come up with this retail so this is the overall view of the retail this is the facade which is in cotton steel which is rusting slowly so changing every day turning towards more of a ochre orange side this is the view at night this is some of the drawings of the cuttings of the metal plates and then there are some plates whose sides have been curved upside so this idea is coming from a lotus pond so these curved shaped metals are lotus flowers that are floating in a lotus pond so we have not changed the color of those uh, 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 those metal sheets or carving up or make it in a different material because we think that lotus flower and the lotus pond is one and the same thing so these lotus flowers are emerging from the lotus pond so you can see this this is how we actually uh, divide uh, spread the whole um, lotus flower on that sheet so these are various options that we worked out to reach to the final one this is the mock up that we developed for that one piece of metal that, that whose sides have been curved and acting as a lotus lotus flower this is a paper model of uh, the facade that we actually construct in our office to look what kind of a feel it can give this is the picture from the down of that particular model and this is the real time facade looking from the down up so these are the sheets that have been curved upside making or representing lotus flower and this is how you look at it this is the inside of the uh, store and uh, this is the reception wall which is in the motif of a paper tree so these are all individual uh, stone cut in a paper format and then joined together and some of them have been gold plated
So to give it an interesting look to the wall. And this is the main wall. Uh, it's a double heighted wall of the store. If you can see there, there's a there's a colored geometrical triangular shaped um, uh, structures that is falling down. This is on the idea of a people tree's leaves falling down from the people tree. So this is done on the both side of the walls and this is in trazo, in the trazo finish. These are all marble pieces of different colors that have been arranged into these staggered and uh, various angles so that it can give an impression of falling uh, leaves as you enter inside the store you can actually visualize it from on both sides like the leaves are falling this is the inside you can see on the both sides the walls this is the inside of the store this is standing on the mezzanine floor looking towards the main entrance again you can see the wall on the both sides this is another picture from the ground floor looking up towards the mezzanine and the stair leading to the first floor this is another view of the store This is the stair wall, which is clad in a local um, stone. This is looking from the first floor down on the mezzanine. This is the first floor area. So the next project, I would like to explain is the Museum of Language. This is a competition project and in this project we actually study the evolution of language and then we stack our programs accordingly because it represents how the evolution of the language takes place that's how we uh, actually organize our program within this building. This is some of the diagrams where you can see that on, on the lower side, on, on the lower basement, we have the archivals. And then the first ground is the reception and information area. Then the first floor is all multipurpose area which is more of the act of speaking, which is probably the first act that a, spe a, a language have taken is the act of speech, uh, act of speaking. So the first floor is all about those activities which involve uh, listening and speaking. And the top floor is the library. The next level of a language that takes place is the written text. So the, all the written text is actually been uh, uh, stacked on the top of the building, which is the largest uh, area um, of this uh, building, and it projects from all sides. So and on, on the top, if you can see, there's a dome. It is a reading area, which actually is the mind of this building. We imagine this as a mind of a building. So this is a cross section of the building. This is an elevation. You can see the big glass dome on the top. Underneath, there's a reading area. It's a multi-level reading area. This is another view of the Museum of Language. The library floor extending and covering all the rest of the floors because that's the level of language 
the evolution of language in which the language actually has been transmitted to the next generation through the written text. This is an outside um, communal area. This is the library on the top floor, it's a view of a library. The next project is the Moscow Retail. It's another international uh, competition project that uh, we took part in. So uh, the program of uh, the store says that they need, uh, apart from the other activities, one communal space where people come and meet. So we actually started from the idea of how people come together and how they interact with each other. So the worst, first thing that came in is the one unit on which they can sit. So we start with, with this one unit and that one unit actually repeats itself in various configurations, changes its dimensions whenever and wherever necessary based on the external conditions like program and other requirements and actually form the whole of the store. The overall aesthetics of the store has been defined by this one singular unit. So then we make a small amphitheater-like uh, configuration on the rear end of the ground floor because it's a two-story store. This is again developed through this one single, repetition of this one single unit. So this is again, this whole, this single unit has been changing its form, its dimensions, and making various configurations that can hold their uh, retail products as well as their, um, as well as their uh, other activities. These are the two levels that you can see. These are some 3D visualization of the project. With the same single unit has been repeated on the walls, they are making the display units, they are creating a, a communal space the people come in, meet, have their activities. This is on the first floor. So this next project, we call it the Threads of a Story. So this project is uh, located in uh, Pakistan, in Karachi. Uh, this is again a retail store that we designed. So we've taken uh, the thread cones as a starting point because that's, these are the thread cones that makes the fabric happen. So we take that thread cones and develop the overall aesthetics of uh, uh, overall aesthetics of the project. So this is how we start developing the external wall, which is, because this, this project is inside the mall, so we, we have the facility to have a wall inside, so there's no weather uh, uh, conditions that are disturbing or hurting the wall. So we use these uh, thread cones as the external wall of the project. So this is how we actually map all the thread cones going to be used in the project and given them specific colors, and we color them manually, and then selecting colors from the color palette for each individual thread cone. So this is how the wall being constructed. It's, it's a very, very interactive um, wall, and uh, uh, this is a very success, I must say it's a very successful project because a lot of people 
come in the uh, coming inside the mall interact with it they touch it even they have their selfies if you can see here there's a lot of people um, on the left they are standing in front of the wall and having their selfies so it is a very, very popular uh, shop in the mall so this is on the back side of the reception and it is done in a smaller thread cones here from the inside you can view the outer um, uh, wall of uh, the store so this next project is a uh, you must have heard about the fire in the Notre Dame. So we also attempted to give a proposal towards that. So this is one of our proposals for the Notre Dame, where actually we constructed the whole roof into the same manner that it was previously been, but we have changed the spire. The area of the spire has been converted into a big glass cone-like structure which has the ability to lit at night. So these are the models we developed for that spire, which actually provides a lot of light to that rest of the floor as well. And we also propose that floor should be converted into a museum for the archival museum for um, uh, the church, uh, for the Notre Dame Cathedral. So these are some of the 3D views. This is how we planned it. This is the plan and the elevation of the proposal. And this has been actually selecting the top 50 regions of Notre Dame. And uh, uh, this is also printed uh, in the book they published called the top 50 regions of Notre Dame. Next project is the Mizan House, is a, is, a, is a big tower, which is situated and located in uh, Lahore. This is done for a bank. And uh, this is again on a proposal uh, stage. This project is actually looking at the overall heritage of uh, Lahore, as well as carefully responding, responding towards the environment. Because you can see there are two towers, one on the front and one on the back, just to reduce the overall thermal mass of the building because the, the larger tower is in the back, it is always in the shade, and it will consume less energy to cool down. So we have taken care of a lot of, there is a lot of consideration of environmental consideration as well as uh, the uh, cultural cons consideration while doing this project. So these are the study models that we developed for uh, this project. Which is a study of the form The material. This is going to be a, a, a large building, tall building. This is the final of the building. This is another view. You can see a big cantilever on the top, which is uh, a rooftop garden. And underneath there is a very traditional geometrical pattern, which is done in a very traditional way. And it's been painted in a very traditional colors because we believe that when, when you sit standing down, so the only part visible to the tall building is the roof underneath. So this, this roof has been given a very unique character. You can see even see uh, the jalis 
the pattern in front of the windows so this is again developed from the logo of uh, the corporate which are and this is how we actually facade screen has been developed on the lower four levels is, is dense and as it goes up it is expanding in size so it, it is getting thinner so this is another view, some of other views of the building this you can see there are two roof gardens developed the next project is an urban school this is this is located in lahore and this is a very very small lot on which we actually build this school which goes vertically up and in this school we try to use all the natural materials possible so that the students or the children can have the feel of the natural materials so we use natural wood we use and in this in this particular school color is one of the material so we use color as a material so you can see the outer windows they're all colors they all all floors have been color coded so this is the facade of the school which is developed in natural uh, wood this is the stairwell which is again constructed in metal and wood which is protective as well as giving a very aesthetically very pleasing look this is a courtyard inside uh, the school and as you can see the railing of all the floors have different colors and this railing is also specially designed so that no one can climb it so it has it has a protective you know quality as well this is another view of the school this is another view of a uh, second floor and top and this is from the top as you can see it is located in a very urban uh, a very dense urban area so all the structural columns of this buildings they come up on the roof and converts into these um, lights so this light gives this building or this light actually is 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 a different kind of an element that gives the building a unique character in the area this is another project which is again um, a competition project synthesis of time this is a cultural center in baghdad in iraq you can see the model of it this is um, uh, in the middle you can see our proposal uh, and the form of our proposal this is the sheet developed this is located in a very uh, uh, densely populated urban area and which is a uh, very um, uh, old area as well so this is uh, this is a site which has been destroyed in the war so they want to develop cultural center there so this is one of our proposals it's it's overall look is very modern looking towards the river but using very uh, by local material which is brick this is all actually clad in brick this is one of the sections of the um, of the project here you can see various levels they connected from the outside to ramps and then the ground floor is completely free for people to come in so uh, this pro this this whole building is open from all sides anyone can come in have their own you know uh, they can they can enjoy the space underneath the building which is free for all and the private programs are happening on the first second and third floor 
where you can go through uh, ramps, stairs, and lifts, which is, of course, controlled uh, entrances. Uh, this is a very interesting project. Uh, it's the house of a Punjabi poet. So we, we, we got a chance to design a house for a Punjabi poet, and then we take that opportunity to actually uh, understand the, uh, the Punjabi poetry and, uh, and the structure of the Punjabi poetry and the recurring patterns of the Punjabi classical poetry, especially, which is Sufi poetry. And from those findings, we actually developed the whole uh, approach towards this project. So this project is actually start with an idea, which is which is uh, uh, which is a very pivotal uh, in, in in Sufi poetry, which is called the refrain. Refrain is a poetic device that is used in classical poetry, which is a verse or a phrase that repeats itself. So in a Sufi poetry, you can find that there are certain phrases or there are certain um, uh, uh, words which are repeated again and again and again in the same uh, uh, in the same uh, 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 lines of the poetry, and we exactly the same way we used walls as a refrain. So there are certain you can see there are certain uh, longitudinal and horizontal walls running through the house which acts as a refrain, which is actually defining the overall space of, um, of the house. Then the house, if you can see, is divided clearly into two areas, one on the front and one on the back, which is connected through a space, which is a walking courtyard. You cannot sit here because it has a dimension of just to walk, to pass through it. So there's a small courtyard which open to sky, so you just have to pass through it. So those two areas have been connected through this. So then we've taken the romantic uh, um, uh, Sufi poetry, a lot of metaphors from there. The one is the parental side, the other is the beloved side, and there, in, in the middle, the walking uh, courtyard is acting more like a space, which is of the space of the nature, which is uh, pretty much uh, you can observe in the Punjabi poetries, which are actually depicting various romantic folklores. Some section you can say on the uh, on the left. Side, the social space slash parental space and then the space of nature and then on the right is the beloved space which is which are all the uh, private areas of the house so this is the outlook of the house which is very simple which is again a very uh, uh, one of the characteristics of the Punjabi poetry classical poetry which actually in which the technique of the Punjabi uh, Sufi poetry and the content, they are so woven together that you cannot separate them. So their content and the technique are the same. Here we use simple, basic brick as, as a structural material, and it is again defining the overall aesthetics of the building. This is another view. This is from the back side. This is that bridge, that courtyard that you pass through and go from one area to another. This is again view of the courtyard and a down window on the front side. This is a library on the first floor. The next project is uh, again located in Lahore, which is called Making a Through um, So this this project is okay. 
this project is located in 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 uh, as I said in Lahore, and it's actually based on the logic of construction. So here we actually try to look at how the wall actually meets the um, roof and how roof actually converts into wall through certain various ways to be employed. So what we have done is the roof of the of the house comes down to so actually the roof Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, now we can hear you. Earlier there was a lot of disturbance, but now we can hear you. So, so this is this is another competition project we've done. Uh, uh, this is uh, iconic mosque, which is uh, in uh, um, UAE. We've so the overall idea of the mosque comes from uh, the idea of the paradise. So paradise being a garden. So we developed the mosque on. Uh, on on uh, on the on 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 the garden on the image of the garden. So this is a big garden in which you go and pray. So the, the if you can see on your left the plan of uh, the mosque, the prayer hall is situated in a big round pond, and the outer prayer area is a big garden where you can see small green patches. These are the patches of the of the trees that actually give it give this whole area a look of a garden so you are actually praying in a garden so this is how we developed this idea and there are other certain interesting uh, features in the project that you can see the whole project has been um, covered with uh, big uh, metal pipes in a geometrical arranged in a geometrical shape so this is overall aesthetics of the project, and you can see the uh, the mesh that is covering the project, the the, the overall uh, side. So this mesh is a is a metal mesh, which are the metal pipes, and they contain um, lights as well as they contain water in it. So in the daytime, they sprinkle very sharp water. Uh, part, uh, particles that converts into mist. So in the, in the daytime, the whole building is covered in a mist, and at the night, the overall the, the lights on the pipe that lit up, and if you are standing inside it, it look looks like you are standing under uh, under a uh, un, un, under under the stars. So this is another view of the mosque. This is the courtyard of the mosque, which is in the form of a, a, a garden. And in the daytime, there's a lot of mist here because the pipes up there, they are sprinkling small particles of water. This is uh, the main, on the right is the main prayer hall, which is connected to another uh, ablation area. This is the minaret of, of the mosque, which is constructed in 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 a, in a like uh, 
uh, tower, uh, a glass tower, which also have a number of activities in it, including the cafe, the garden of for exotic plants, and then on top is a viewing deck. Uh, uh, now I'll show you two of our very recent projects. They are, they are under construction, but uh, this is one is the Green Mall, and this project is located in Faisalabad in uh, in Pakistan. And Faisalabad is again is an industrial city, is a very progressive city. So this is how the project is coming up. It is still under construction. This is a big geometrical uh, uh, grid made of wood and there's a triangular glass in it. The important feature of the project is the sky because the sky actually forms, it's actually part of the aesthetics, overall aesthetics of the project because it reflects in a very interesting way on the, uh, on the facade of the building. some of the views on the inside. This is the scale of the project you can see. The, these are the steps leading down to the lower ground. So I've said this is under construction. So these are the pictures during the construction. So this is the last project I'm going to show you. This is a corporate tower, which is again in a proposal stage. It is developed uh, for, uh, for a private client and it is located on, on, on the canal road in, on, in Lahore. So this is the study model. In this model, we actually um, have studied the traditional uh, uh, buildings in which there are certain components of the traditional buildings. If you, if you look at, uh, the Mughal era buildings, they have a certain very well-defined plinth level, which is a reception level and which is way above the ground. And then there comes the walls, which are very decorative. And then inside the top uh, ceiling or roof is in the form of a dome, which is actually representing the universe, the, the, the sky, the, uh, the heavenly you know, uh, bodies. So this project is again relying on those categories, on those different layers where the reception is being kept on the second floor. So the first two floors are making the plinth of, for that reception. And then there's an area which is very decorative, which has been uh, constructed uh, from um, a colored glass. And then on top of that, the three floors, they are cut in the form of a dome that reflects the sky onto 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 the floor which is for the uh, for the communal activities so this is the sketch of the project so you can see the area which is uh, in between from level 4 to level 9 in a square street it is a decorative area this is a, a, a a model of the project. So you can see the middle part. Uh, we, have, we have not shown the colors here, but you can see the decorative uh, 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 pattern of that particular area. This is another view of the um, model. This is how the reception level has been connected through an escalator, external escalator. So I end my uh, presentation uh, by this quote by Homi Baba that architecture is amongst the most, sorry, that architecture is amongst the most monumental of cultural constructions, functional, practical, durable, designed, and yet it only becomes architecture when it pre its presence is permeated with a thought that overwhelms its physical 
questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Over to you, Brito. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fawad. Thank you for the presentation, which had a lot of variety in terms of the projects. And uh, it was an array of all types of projects and the buildings that are coming up. And uh, I see a couple of questions uh, there already. But okay. I think before we go to them, uh, I uh, what we could do is we could take in a couple of discussions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, one thing that I observe is that is a definite response to the existing context by way of screens, jallies, external features. And what I really like is that you've been able to add quite a few elements, you know, traditional elements, and materiality becomes extremely important here. So you've expanded with metal, wood, stone, and uh, colors and spaces. And eventually, because of that, we've been able to get a rich, earthy quality, especially mm -hmm. in the retail stores. I mean, retail mm -hmm. stores are some of the most uh, corporate looking, mundane, you know, similar looking places. And because of the yeah. type of materials you've used, you've been able to add a certain amount of character, sense of belonging and individuality to that place. So I think uh, that's really commendable and uh, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to do it. I mean, I can understand how clients behave uh, almost everywhere, especially in the third uh, world. Really really part, yeah, yeah, it's very difficult so, to convince the client. But, uh, uh, I must say that uh, to to convince the client, you have to really work work really really hard because uh, really? in our office, in our office we don't uh, talk about client too much. Uh, does uh, does not mean that we don't respect. We definitely respect them, but not talk in terms of that client has destroyed our project. We always say we destroyed our project because we have not been able to con uh, convey our idea to the client in a way that convinces the client that it is the idea for that particular project. Because Absolutely. one thing is clear, the client is going to spend millions of rupees on our decisions. So we have to be very careful. We have to be very you know, meticulous while uh, presenting our projects, while presenting our works. And it looks like that the work has been done that millions of rupees is going to be spent on it. You cannot Absolutely. present in front of a client one single paper and says spend millions of rupees on it, not at all, not at Absolutely. all. Absolutely. So it has to be totally worked out. And yeah. uh, I really like the fact that you, you know, you are an academician and you have certain theoretical ideas before you bring them to practice. That makes the process very much interesting. And when we look at your presentations, that process is extremely evident. The, with the sketches moving to models, the models moving to those working models, and then the final output that you term in, in, in this thing of a building, in form of a building. So there is tradition, there is association, there is light, there is modernism, materiality, and a lot of it. And I think it's a very young practice. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's commendable that you do not have a very distinct mark because you are experimenting with a lot of things. I think it's... Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so... so I, you, you just talked about I, material. My, uh, and our cho choice of the material. So I must say that, uh, that is not our choice. That comes through the process that we actually go through to uh, to, to design. Because when we, we know that we have to do the archaeology of the site, that uh, and that site is not limited to that lot which is given to us. It is a bigger chunk. It is like the whole city is become the site for us. So when we are going through that whole uh, uh, you know investigation of it, because that's how we go about our projects, then those those materials comes automatically. It it is not our choice. We have not determined that prehand. That comes automatically to us. That these could be the materials and that already have that association to 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 that uh, uh, to that area's people so that's how we work that's how it goes about it's not our intelligence Great. And it's in our, fact, I it's love our, the... a lot of uh, you know um, <laughs> uh, hard work that that brings that material to us <laughs> so we are not that intelligent <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I, I think the most intelligent thing in this world is to take lessons from whatever you have. So I think, uh, of course, it's intelligent because you're taking cues from the existing. And uh, yeah. I really like the lotus and the people leaves. 
uh, though uh, and and the and the fact that crafts and, and the fact that the craftsmen did it themselves you know because that yeah. is true uh, tribute to the craftsmen of the country and the world that they are able to kind of work on life projects yeah true, so true. Uh, going on to the question that we have uh, Juderia, do we have a list of the questions just a minute there was a very interesting question from this lady, uh, Ritu Deshmukh. Should I read it out now? Yeah, please. Uh, so, uh, Ritu Deshmukh was asking that uh, for Watson's project, how do you relate it to time and space? And uh, how do you think that your projects will attain timelessness? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, that could be in my mind that it should attain timelessness, but it's not entirely in my hand. Number one, uh, because as I've said, uh, that uh, the idea of constructing that uh, that uh, that traditional sense is 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 through a lot of labor and hard work. Hard work. So what we can do is we just have to put a lot of hard work and labor into our projects by collecting materials, analyzing it, and then converting it or, uh, or, 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 or making it into, into, into our, our, our uh, uh, projects. So the timelessness is an idea that definitely is in the mind, but it's not in my hand. I cannot do that. But on the other side, on the other side, uh, when we analyze uh, 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 the information we got, we analyze in the light of the time we are in. So that's how the overall information become very much re relevant to the time. We get, we don't take information and then employ it as it is. That's why I've said we we don't believe in repeating things. Tradition for us is actually developing that that certain sense and then evaluating all that information that is coming from the past to us, but analyzing in a very present situation, their, 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 their importance, their, their relevance to, 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 the, to the given social, uh, and, uh, um, uh, social infrastructure. So uh, that, that analysis actually makes us use the material in a, in a certain way, and that is the point where we actually bring in the time, the, 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 the current time in which we are located. So, so it's, it's not the idea that we just take information and employ it. No, that we have to analyze. So that analysis is very, very crucial. I hope I have given the answer. Yeah, yeah, I think you, of course, you, of course. It was not with us anymore. I think she's left and she wanted to see the link later. She is, she had social work, I guess. Uh, oh. Juvedi, I think there's another question. I don't know why this doesn't open in my laptop. Can you read it out, please? Uh, yes, yes, sure. Uh, the next question that we have is from uh, Shreshtha Jain. Uh, so she is asking that uh, when you were talking about the Museum of Language, what was the role of the dome? Since you had uh, described that every floor and every level had uh, a purpose and it was associated with one aspect. So she wants to know whether the dome was uh, associated with anything. Yeah, yeah. At the top level is, of course, is, is the uh, more, most evolved form of language, which is the written text. So it contains the library. And at the same time, uh, there is a reading area which is actually, actually um, uh, one, one can say uh, a homage to that mind that actually developed the whole idea of language, the written text. So this reading area is actually representing the mind of a man. So that's why it's in a certain way, in a certain shape, and it connects to the whole world. That's why it, it is given a glass uh, dome, which where you can see the sky Sky, where you've been connected to the universe and that's the area where you sit where you can think where you read so this is this is this is actually related to the human mind 
also i believe i think uh, the dome becomes like a unifying uh, element to the layers i'm i'm so, yeah. i guess that's what say that. I, of course of course of course there. and related uh, to and the, i think it abstracts it abstracts the mind and the fact that it's kind of the most powerful organ of the body you know i think yeah, it also definitely, that. definitely. that's what been given the top most position <laughs> yeah. in our body as well <laughs> well absolutely and there is this topi we have on our top so it has to <laughs> kind of come across so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well uh, there's another question uh, so tabish says you quoted ts elliot that architecture must evoke an idea and what is the one most important idea that your architectural works evoke uh, to think the only idea we promote is when you look at architecture think when you have to do architecture please think because uh, uh, because gradually architects actually have given away their space of thinking clients come to us while they have done with thinking on the project they don't think project with us so that's the problem we are just the draft person of the clients we are just the draft person of those projects so do, we don't want to be that we want to be a thinking person that clients or the pro, or the developers come to us and think with us because we are the one who is going to shape the overall in uh, you know uh, physical infrastructure of the cities so we want to regain that space which is related to the thought which is related to the process of thinking so the only one idea if i can if i can uh, you know name it is uh, to think our building can probably are, be yeah yeah sorry sorry please continue please go ahead and and probably the fact that you've had a single unique idea for every building differently so there is no persistent idea but the fact that every building and every project can evoke different ideas and different thoughts and different exactly. thinking processes it, it is not possible it is because every project is unique project every site is a unique site so how can you have a single idea employing on all the various sites and for all the problems for each new problem you have a unique idea that's why i say uh, that's why that's why i've said that we believe in experimentation because that's the only way you come up with uh, with unique solutions for unique problems and then we make those problems unique sometimes they are those are not unique we make them that's why we said that the client when the cl a client comes in it comes in with a very you know basic uh, uh you know understanding of their own projects they come up with a scope which is very basic and then we make it an extraordinary scope we make and we convert it into an extraordinary thing because then we start thinking along with the client it's not thinking against the client it's like thinking along the client so we believe that they come with a very ordinary brief and then we have to make it an extra ordinary thing so we have to uh, actually uh which is more of a philosophical uh, thing that we have to think a lot of interesting questions within that project that takes us to a certain way that that actually makes us uh, approach a project in a, in a very unique way totally totally i totally agree with you when you say that the client comes with a brief and he says i want a commercial complex so you will have yeah. to uh, make make it first make him feel that it is it's extraordinary find yeah. out that extraordinary thing and then relate to him or be or other i must say connect and he feels as excited about it and he starts this simultaneous parallel thinking with you so that you know he starts believing that it's going to be extraordinary and that is what yeah. architectural practice is all yeah. about so it's a beautiful I, I thing to say it's a beautiful that, thing to say those those water stores that we've seen that retail stores which is in brick and wood and metal and those pond Uh, uh, uh you know uh, uh that's lotus pond uh, uh, project uh, uh, the client just said us that make us a retail store that's it and look at our previous stores and just make another one right. it's just not uh, client's choice to make it a lotus pond on the front facade and then use local brick you know 
that's that's, that's, that's how the architect has to um, um, you know uh, go beyond the ordinary has to go beyond the ordinary because the client must be very good at its own trade its own its own business but probably he's he has so we have to work with the client to know our our trade as well so our trade we are the master so we have to make the client understand not going against it that they, that client does not understand my point of course they don't understand they have not done five years of education <laughs> they should not be <laughs> but but you understand and make them understand that's that's our our, our one of our responsibility we we tell our uh, young young architects that whenever you meet a client you are defining architecture on a larger scale your single meeting with a client defines the architecture for on a, on a, for for everyone because that's how the client will take architecture if you are meeting with the client is in a very irresponsible tone then they think the architects are like that if you have if you if you go about your meetings with the client in a responsible way they will think architect as a responsible human being or responsible professional so so we have to be very careful when we are dealing with clients because we are defining our architecture on a very general level absolutely absolutely i totally agree and there was one of my professors who used to say that architects are missionaries and they should yeah. work like missionaries and propagate the cause of architecture throughout you know so it's education True. practice and teaching and everything together so great True, right, uh, right. we have another so we have another question where uh, this guy says how do you finalize the materials like what process goes into this we look for the local materials or do you start a mood board or how how do you start off you know okay um i think uh, uh, first of all that you you need to think that that's, that's, that's our process that we we really investigate the site and the site again does not mean that lot given to us it is a larger context it is a context of a city so so we have to look at the mood of that city and where the city is currently situated because you cannot design or you are not designing 100 year for for 100 uh, for, for 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 the past 100 years you are designing for the coming 100 years probably so you have to see where the city is going what is the what is the under current of the city so a lot of things that that actually makes us decide what kind of a materials they are going to be like you have seen the green mall which is the it, it is again it, it it has a big glass pans because that is situated in a very modern area number 1 in a very progressive city which is an industrial city as well and we are doing we are we working with a pro very progressive clients so there are certain element there could be numerous elements that are coming together to make you think or decide what kind of material you're going to use so of course there there are mood boards but those moods are not my moods those moods are the moods of the city those moods are the socio economical condition of that particular city in that particular moment absolutely absolutely and of course like you said the materials exist within the city and they just have to i mean you just have to find them yeah so i hope this question was answered another question says what encouraged you for the small detailing of elements like railings or bottom of the ceilings that are often left attend unattended in many projects yeah <laughs> um Uh, that's probably um, i must say is a love for the profession you have to have a love for the profession so uh, but because uh, details at the end of the day make overall um, you know aesthetics or sets the sets of the project but uh, you have to have uh, that love for it and you know if you love someone you you really you know look at every aspect of that person thing whatever you love so think about your loved ones if you think in 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 such detail about your loved ones that's how have you have to think about architecture that's a love affair absolutely 
absolutely absolutely <laughs> it's about the underside it's about the back side it's about the front side it's about all sides right. so yes it's everything great uh, uh, there, there is that, another i'll uh, try to read a lot of poetry so probably you'll come to know that uh, and you have a big tradition of the po uh, poetry tradition so the yeah, that, that's in the air that's in in this in in, in, your, in the air of the city that attention to detail is there Uh, and i think it's it's important it's a very unique thing that people would highlight just on the front and not really on the uh, for, uh, you know soffits of the ceilings and railings people don't concentrate on it so much so but then mm -hmm. detailing it means that we are giving attention to every aspect be it small yeah, or yeah. big uh, and and it is uh, secondly uh, this is not something which is outside uh, the realm of design if you are designing a building you are designing everything then how can you say this is like railing uh, keep it you know undesigned or you know <laughs> this is a <laughs> you're, you're designing, you're designing everything there there's no categories in it if you are number one you are either you are designing or you are not designing i agree well uh, there's another question which is god has not thought it like that otherwise some sides of us will be very you know <laughs> undesigned <laughs> and ugly i must say <laughs> well i really liked your mosque project and i think it was a very different abstracted take on the way we look at mosques because they yeah. are normally closed spaces you know so that lighted up serene paradise type of an atmosphere was extremely stimulating and there is a question on it too so yeah. uh, she says is religious symbolism an important consideration when designing mosques in the contemporary context i mean is symbolism as important yeah. as the uh, uh, yeah so yeah uh, i can really understand that uh, there is a problem to the symbolism uh, number one is that you you have to be uh, really acquainted with that symbol uh, uh, symbolic system someone who wanted to understand it has to have that knowledge of it but one thing that we all have is uh, probably are the emotions that we been we been we been built like that that we 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 automatically react to things emotionally so we try to design with the emotions rather than the symbols symbols are more abstract and they are more further away from us it it needs a lot of intellectual and rigorous you know uh, intellectual rigor so we want that we should design with the things that humans have already built in in, in themselves which is uh, which is which is Uh, uh, your sensations you've been you've been actually associated with the world through your sensations so design with the sensation it it should have some sensation to the building that goes beyond and it it is more immediate i must say the sensations are more immediate the symbolism is too far it's too far fetched an idea for that you have to be really equipped with the knowledge of that symbolic you know uh, whole system so we try to decide and design uh, uh, very close to humans rather than ideas that are away from it uh, i'll i'll rephrase this question uh, fawad see yeah. what happens is that we architects are always uh, you know we always face this uh, difference between the real and the abstract and we would always mm -hmm. want to take this abstracted world forward and we would say that you know it needs not it need it need not be too much in your face type of a thing you know if it's a mosque people know that they are going into a mosque and they should kind of expect a different type of an environment but mm -hmm. uh, what i've also realized with my uh, practice and experience is that uh, the lay people or the normal people who are going into a mosque do expect certain type of in your face things you know especially mm -hmm. religious spaces be it a mosque a temple a church or any other place and that association you know gives them a sense of belonging and the mm -hmm. absence of that association takes them away from it and they start mm -hmm. questioning whether they are really in the religious realm or not so mm -hmm. do you think uh, with your practice and your experience do you think that beyond the space should we also be adding such symbolisms to make it appeal also to the lay persons 
Okay, um, um, I, I think it, uh, it's very good, very, very good question, but there are a lot of presuppositions in it. Number one, that lay person associate, associate with the things which is already there. Of course, probably, probably, I don't, um, I, I, I don't think so, because this, I feel like it's more of a presupposition, because you are more concerned with, with your inner feelings when you are inside these kind of uh, spaces. So they, they, are, they are more, more touching you uh, uh, inside rather than your very obvious external uh, stimuli like eyes. It's more your inner satisfaction of that space. When the space does not give you that first immediate sensation of satisfaction, then you look for the second one. And the second one is the symbols. I agree with that. The, the first one is a difficult one because once you got a very good sense, even in your house, in some part of your house, so you, you want it to be there. You don't want any symbolism there. You don't want any signs there. You don't want any murti there. You just sit there. You love sitting there. So that's the first immediate thing. That yes, the second one is if the space does not provide you that, then you need another kind of symbolisms to make them understand that this space needs to be respected. But this is a dictation. They are not respecting it out of their own respect. They have been respected because there's a symbolism to it, attached to it. And that symbolism is again, that I've said, is the second level, the second layer that you need when your spaces fail to convey what they have to convey. If they fail to convey, then put a, you know, symbol there. They will associate themselves to that. I agree with that. But we want to challenge ourselves to I make us. <laughs> I totally agree with what you're saying. We are on the same page, but the, but the world doesn't believe in us. So, yeah. <laughs> so they keep on adding symbols all the time. You know? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, then uh, there is another question, and he says the last project, corporate tower, the idea, uh, the idea and the concept are amazing, but at that mm -hmm. kind of large scale, how can you manage to build that entire building? structure based only on four columns structural system uh, yeah, so yeah. he says that uh, mm -hmm. he says that mm -hmm. the structural system has 14 intermediate level differences and also has a mm -hmm. large scale so how was the structural system managed i i must say that uh, that gentleman or gentlewoman has a very keen eye uh, and uh, and it's a very good observation but uh, uh, that's another way we designed. I, I, I'll, I'll uh, explain that as well. That uh, when we are designing, we don't uh, uh, take these technical things under so much consideration. So these are the things that we worked out and designed with the structural engineers. We don't do it ourselves. So we don't take these things into account while expressing our ideas. So they are always on the second level of our uh, intervention, which is done in the presence of the technical team. What have what, what we've done now, actually generally in, in, in general practice, we are more concerned, architects are more concerned with the, with the technical stuff, which is we are not even legally in, allowed to design. So we are, we are more concerned with the structural system, we are more concerned with the public health system, we are more concerned, but we are not concerned with the space, we are not concerned with the architecture of it. So in, in our practice, we don't take these things into account before uh, we completely express ourselves. So these, these the, that, that particular project is on a very initial stage where we are experimenting and still discovering the overall aesthetics of the project. So we don't want to make it more complicated and 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 get a lot of uh, multiple layers messed up. So first we have to express ourselves what we want, and then we bring our structural team in to design with us the structure for a certain kind of space. Great. Thank so it's you. not going to rest on the four column. It's not going to. Rest assured, it's not going to rest on the four columns. We're going to add more. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, great, great. There is a uh, next question, and uh, this girl says that we saw the rusting uh, lotus facade, which is a very character-providing move, but it is also an obstruction in the in the durability of the building. Then what inspires us to consider the aesthetics above durability? Uh, no, no, I don't think so because the sheet, the size of the sheet is too thick. It's a, it's a very heavy sheet. It's not going to rust away. And secondly, secondly, we already have considered and discussed this idea with the client that if it's going to rust away, the only facade, the front surface is going to rust away. It actually changes the overall facade with time if completely rust away, not the system which is actually um, holding it. That system is not rusting away. That's there. But probably the overall uh, surface, the front surface is rusting away. But it takes a lot of years to rust away because it's a very thick sheet. And I think I'd like to add to it, you know, I think it's a great move to use uh, metals with patina finish or rust finish because even after, after they rust a bit, they still look the same. So yeah, exactly. instead of using brand new shiny materials, which after an year look dated and, you know, bad, bad looking, this is a great idea to be used on facades. I think we should, uh, we are trying to make people live with the materials and their defects of the materials, they call it defect. So they have to live with it because this, this, that's how we are. We are living with the people which are, which already have a lot of defects, you know, <laughs> with those, why not then, then, uh, then at least, you know, they bear the materials as well. Absolutely. It's a more Absolutely. way of, you know, accommodating them. Absolutely. And I think it's like wine, you know, it ages uh, as much as it grows. So it looks better the moment uh, the, the weather touches it. Lovely example. There is another question from the uh, another girl who says, uh, which project most should be most challenging for you? In what way? Which project do you think is most big? Uh, what is the most challenging project? Sorry. Uh, that which I cannot hear you. Challenging firm. Yeah, which project uh, post to be most challenging for you and how? Uh, okay, I, I have not shown uh, one of the projects uh, which is uh, there, which is we've designed a, um, a, a small display bathroom for a retail store small display bathroom for a detailed store and we design it on the theme of the sun and the earth so the overall aesthetics of the project involves the idea of the universe you know the idea of the earth the idea of the life because in the bathroom you actually face everything the water is there you know the life is there so that's the smallest project we have done even that project is challenging to us. So I wanted to say every project that comes to our office is challenging. Even if, if we're designing a single door, it poses us so many challenges, but probably the smaller the project, the greater the challenge is. Totally, totally. I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, there is another question which says, do you have a permanent uh, specialized team of craftsmen or do you involve the local craftsmen for the different locations of your projects? And how do you find such uh, no, craftsmen no. who really help you? No, we don't have a permanent uh, craftsperson with us. We use the local ones wherever we go. And then we have a very good team of, uh, yes, that, that we don't employ them, but it's an it's, it's a, it's a independent team of contractors that actually make sure that they bring in the best craftsperson of the area. As and then we start interacting with them. So we don't uh, employ them. So uh, it's, it's not a hegemony that we have a certain number of craftsmen and they're only going to work in our projects. No, we work there, wherever we, we have our projects, we work the people there uh, in that particular area. 
and it's the responsibility of the contractor to bring in all those uh, uh, person and the client so, of course. Uh, so another question that I would like to add to this one is, do you leave certain details to be worked out once those craftsmen are hired or do you make those details before? Because uh, I mean, they would be the best no. people to tell you what details would be uh, necessary for getting oh, the type of finish that we we change a lot of things because uh, our projects are uh, changing all the time it's changing all the time it's, it's a, we we and we don't believe in okay, that the project is designed and in now now it's been you know uh, it's been frozen no and architecture is not a frozen music to us it is music but not frozen at all so no, it's moving it's completely changing so it changes with the uh, with 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 every uh, evolution like uh, we we go to sites a lot. We go to site a lot. We get, we take a lot of pictures of the site. We come back. We analyze them. We see where we need to change it, and then we change it again. So uh, that's a, that's an ongoing process until unless we give away the key to the to the client. So Absolutely. so it changes a lot. Absolutely, and this is the true Bahaz philosophy where we say that working with the craftsmen and the uh, people who are on the site will actually add value to the design. So uh, it's a very, very well then, worked out I, approach. So working with the craftsman is nothing, something very, very you know, uh, not not kind of a fashionable thing for me, or is something a buzz thing for me. It, 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 we have our you know uh, compulsions to work with them. Simple is that because they know their craft well. They, I, I don't have any romantic idea of the craft persons. I, I will give away with them any any time I, I um, you know I make sure someone else can do that in a better way. So so I don't have any romantic romanticizing notion of that craft person working on my projects, local materials. No, not at all. That's how the logically things fall. If it's, it fell some other way, I'm okay with that. I'm completely okay with that. It does add a lot of regional character and a unique character. So I am, yeah. I think the way you've used them is uh, commendable. There is another question which I don't understand very well, but I'll still ask it. It says, how does the interior influence spaces in your buildings? I mean, uh, I think uh, possibly it means that how uh, do you think? Does the interior come first or does the space come first? Or do you think of the interior simultaneously uh, while you're designing the spaces? Or I think uh, uh, number one, it's very important that we should not look at architecture or any other design form in 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 uh, various smaller categories. Okay, this is interior. This is architecture. This is uh, embellishment. This is ornamentation. No, that's one and the same thing. It has to make sense when they come together. That's more important. It's like making a painting. You cannot paint while keeping things. This is this, this is chair. This is, no, every component of the painting at the end of the day has to contribute to the emotional statement that a painter wanted to convey. So the overall space has to have that unifying, uh, you know, sensation in it. So every element is contributing in it. It's like looking at a beautiful face. Every element is contributing in the beauty of that face. Because you cannot say the eyes is that the, the elements are there, but at the end of the day, everyone comes together and produce a certain sensation. So we take the space as not something which is divided into various components, but one unified thing. That's the exact idea as of our time. That's why I say time precedes the space. The time, you cannot divide it into categories of past, present, and future. It's one. You have your past right now with you. You are actually acting on the basis of what you have learned previously. So it's with you all the time. You cannot give it away. It's not sitting somewhere far from you and you have to fetch it. No, you don't have to fetch it. It's there. So that's how it's unified. I totally agree. It's a whole to part and a part to whole process and the interior has to augment the existing space. Yeah. 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 Well, adding another, uh, one single element, you have to go back and look at the overall picture. Then you add another element, you go back, step back and look at the overall composition. Wherever you find the composition is correct, 
there you freeze it. That's, that's it. And then our pro in, in architecture, uh, it's very different from painting and other because we have a number of stakeholders involved in it. So we have to go through this process again and again and again. Probably painter has to go through this process once. But we have to go through when we are designing ourselves, then we are presenting it to the client, then we have to go through it and make it again. Then when it comes into the construction, then there are changes, then we have to go back again and rework it again to make it a whole. So that it gives a one picture at the end of the day, one sensation at the end of the day. So we have to go through this process multiple times. Totally, and then think about the economics also. Yeah, <laughs> no one thinks about that. <laughs> it's a universal problem. Right. The next question is, yeah, totally. What's your concept of green? He's saying, have you ever tried in applying for a star rating in any of your projects? So is any of your building uh, green rated? No, uh, no, not at all. And I think it's a, I think more of a, it's a, it's a corporate kind of uh, culture rather than something that architects uh, should fall for uh, because that's the only way to design. How can you say this is a, this is the green way of designing? This is another way. What is another way of design? You have to design according to the environment. You have to make every uh, uh, space uh, lit with the natural light. You have to provide air into it. So what's, is there another, any other way of doing it? Are we architectural schools making them design in a different way and then they have to learn something green? I don't think so. Uh, this is a, the corporate's way of, uh, you know, making money again because this whole green thing and if that uh, uh, person is aware of that lead is a private institute, is a private corporate. It's not something which is, you know, uh, uh, which is something uh, uh, government owned or something. It's a, it's a private organization. They take money to give you certification. So this is a business proposition. Green rating lead is a business proposition. This is a private organization that give you that certification. It's not something, you know, done uh, um, to favor the building industry. It's done to make money. Totally, totally. My words too. <laughs> uh, another question is, when he says in today's scenario, coronavirus epidemic, is uh, has is prevalent and social distances need to be required in public buildings how should students and architects deal with this kind of crisis in their future designs and their projects um i would say that uh, uh, historically speaking uh, these conditions comes and go we should not you mull too much over the temporary situations that happens once when our our uh, our country was under terrorist attacks. You 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 know the history and uh, the number of terrorist you know uh, activities here, uh, uh, bomb blast and all that. But those are the like temporary situations. You cannot think temporary situation as a permanent one and make yourself uh, convert yourself into a patient, a psychological patient. I don't want to think like that. It's a temporary situation. It will go away. We don't need to, you know, uh, make it uh, something that's going to be forever. You have to be optimistic. You have to be optimistic. We don't need to think like that. So the temporary situations are temporary. Whatever you do, do it temporarily. It's not something which is going to stay. No, no epidemic stays forever. So I yeah, don't think I so agree. to make it something. Uh, as something that's going to be our lifestyle no not at all it's going to change yeah absolutely and if it and it's just added another perspective and i think if you're designing our buildings well i don't think there's any scare yeah I mean, buildings who were not yeah, yeah, designed exactly. well probably still have a scare so uh, and it's not the building who's making it it's the humans who are making it you have to leave contact with the humans not the buildings <laughs> so so but design something around the humans <laughs> to contain them uh, there's another I actually, question I, I actually designed a corona hat as well for a female um, you know version of it 
uh, it's a hat that you wear all around you and it, it keeps a safe distance as well and protects others from uh, from the infection <laughs> so <laughs> probably that's more more needed yeah i think humans will have to change the way they interact with humans and especially we in the third world do not have this concept of a space you know we are all over yeah. each other so i think that that is something that we'll need to change uh, yeah, another question from Nish so nishant yes agreed yeah. another question from nishant he says it's amazing uh, feat to get all yeah, yeah. that work executed how do you manage to train the local craftsmen in the technology driven design and minimalism and what are the challenges so how are the local craftsmen trained and you know with this current uh, I, driven I technology so. driven design yeah again uh, uh, i don't think so i need to train them you just have to give them the business they'll train themselves don't worry again i don't have a romantic notion about craft person i'm going to train them not at all why should i train them i'll give them the opportunity they'll train themselves they know how to train themselves they have they have already learned it so so i i i am not training them not at all i am giving them the opportunity i i i sit with them we collectively along with the contractor come up with the solutions the problem our designs is posing and then we go about the solutions so the craft person already have a certain skill set with them the problem given to them actually pertain to that particular skill set that they already have what they are doing is that we are just pushing the limits of that skill set we are just pushing the limits of their you know uh, 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 of their of their working because they have been trained they have been actually uh, habitual in working in a certain way which is more of a traditional way of repetitive things they keep repeating repeating things but in our designs when we give them out of you know routine then we have to push them a little but they do it because they know how to do it you just need to push them to do it i don't train them well i think we are done with the questions for what train them and great uh, thank you these are easy i ones. think it was a really interesting session those are easy and, and uh, i think thank you and and i think an extremely interactive session also where there were quite a few questions and uh, i think your presentation evoked those sensations within the people so thank you so much for I sharing your work very boring so, thank you and much. especially the first part so no no not at I, all i'm not happy at that all. everyone is so and not at thank all. you very much for having me thanks a lot so we would like to thank you and possibly future associations will continue where we can have you over for juries and seminars also so hopefully sure, let's sure, look right. forward to a more more collaborative future yeah thank you thank you rito thank you very much it is lovely talking to you and 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 all the students thanks for uh, so patience uh, patient with me and listening to all uh, what i have to present and uh, i hope that in future we will stay in touch and share our knowledge together thank you very much absolutely 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 thank you thank Thanks you so much and a very good evening and bye bye thank you